now um, it's the, the time for Enzo D'Ardenio with his presentation, which is static images, diagram in Delta, brief, uh, brief of the white. Enzo D'Armenio is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Liège, working on the project Kinema, um, Kinet Images. Uh, uh, <laughs> per, um, I, I get lost. Perpertaining to the interactive, sorry, so to the interactive images of video games and virtual reality, and funded by the Fund for Scientific Research. He has carried out the Marie Curie Individual Fellowship Project Imactis, fostering critical identity through social media archival images, in which he analyzed identity-related images on the social networks. He has published articles on international journals such as Semiotica, Visual Communication, Mediation et Information, and he's also the author of the monograph Mondi Paralleli, Parallel Words, Rethinking the interactivity in video games. And the floor is yours. Thank you, Christina. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be able to participate in this important symposium. And I would like to thank uh, Claudio uh, Massimo and Maria Giulia for the invitation and uh, for the organization of this event. Uh, my talk uh, is part of a project devoted to video game and virtual reality, which I propose a new theoretical hypothesis for the analysis of their meaning. I already worked on this object during my master's degree in semiotics, and I published a monograph uh, on video games in uh, 2014. I recently resumed this research as part of a postdoc founded by the National Research Fund in Belgium entitled Kinet image, the media interactive and tank image cinetic, in genealogy, the media visual, from this of the concept of movement. The purpose of this project is to try to offer a new understanding of the narrative and social qualities of video games and virtual reality, starting from the analysis of movement. My talk is organized into three blocks. Uh, in the first part, I will discuss the concept of interaction that is at the center of academic reflection. I will then propose the concept of image movement to describe the semiotic functioning of video games in virtual reality. Uh, with this notion, I intend to indicate expressive systems that are based on the interrelation of two groups of semiotic qualities or syntaxes, a visual syntax and a kinetic syntax. In the second part, I will focus on the concept of immersion, my thought is that the immersion effect is the result of the perceptual and pragmatic movement made by the viewer, and that it's always accompanied by moments when, on the contrary, the viewer operates at cognitive distance. And finally, in the third part, I will consider the case of The Legend of Zelda, Breath of the Wild. So, first part uh, about interaction. Uh, with the concept of interaction, the scientific literature intends to distinguish media such as video games and virtual reality from traditional media such as literature and film. The interaction of virtual reality and video games would allow the viewer to participate in the experience, to make active choices, as opposed to a movie or book in which the viewer adopts a passive role. However, the scientific literature has not fully clarified what distinguishes this meaning of interaction for, from interpretative interaction. The now classical concepts of ergotic literature proposed by Espen Arset allow us to understand the, this difference. Uh, so, on the one hand, ergotic literature differs from standard literature in the mechanism it requires from its reader. No longer its reading resolve in the mind of the individual, the cybertext requires a non-trivial effort to be traversed, that is, an active exploration through their medial materiality. On the one hand, Arstedt rightly insists that the difference between traditional text and cybertext lies not in the rather obvious differentiation between linear and non-linear reading, but in the fact that in the latter, and I quote, each decision will make some parts of the text more and other less accessible, and you may never know the exact results of your choice that is exactly what you missed. 
What is at stake in my talk is twofold. On the one hand, I aim to characterize most precisely this idea of the non-trivial effort of traversing specific virtual experiences. And on the other hand, I seek to understand the particular effects of their overall interpretation. In other words, two basic questions about meaning in virtual experiences arise. How do we as usual user access the virtual experiences starting from our everyday experience and how these experiences are articulated? In my opinion, access to the meaning of virtual experiences is based on two closely interrelated macro acts. That of perceiving a scene delivered by the device and usually articulated in more or less figurative virtual space and a kinetic act through one's movement on the interface, which are transformed in real time into virtual movements. Um, becomes that of analyzing visual movement. Though Lesting had previously distinguished the art of space, such as sculpture and painting, from the art of time, such as poetry and music, cinema had already put the dichotomy into question. From his part, Gilles Deleuze proposed the concept of movement, movement image to explain the deep interrelation between visual qualities and quality of movements for the understanding of cinematographic images. More recently, Andrea Pinotti has elaborated the notion of environment image in order to underline the in, in, inhabitable and explorable character of interactive media. My proposal starts from the fact that the specificity of virtual experiences is based on the necessity on the part of the spectator to perform movements on the interface in order to accomplish movements within the virtual space. For this reason, I propose to reverse the Lazy's formula with the concept of image movement. This concept designates expressive systems articulated according to two intersecting syntaxes, a visual and a synthetic syntax. Here are some examples. In the Assassin's Creed saga, for instance, the figurative space and the audiovisual narration follows the norm of the historical conspir conspiracy genre through the visual syntax, whereas the kinetic system sets up an acrobatic e exploration close to parkour, requiring vertiginous pursuits and the climbing of monuments, a system underlined by the kinetic syntax. Visual syntax concerns the organization of virtual space, the characterization of the avatar, the point of view, and the more or less dense figurativeness that characterize them. Kinetic syntax, on the other hand, installs for kinetic relation what may be called a diagram, according to Peirce's definition. Uh, a diagram between movements made on the interface and virtual movements. In video game, movements upon the interface are usually abstract and plastic, because they are not expressed through recognizable figure or themes, but through abstract commands such as up, down, left, right, or using other activator keys such as A, B, etc. Movements in the virtual world, on the other hand, often translate the abstract movement upon the interface into a system of figurative and thematic movement, such as running, jumping, shooting, and climbing. Between these two types of movements, a kinetic diagram associates the abstract command upon the interface with more or less figurative and thematic movements within the virtual world. This diagram of kinetic relation establishes the rhythmic and aspectual resonance between, between the two systems of movements. For example, punctual movements such as jumping within the virtual world may be matched with equally punctual movements on the interface. In other words, the non-trivial effort that Art had spoken of does not concern a generic interaction, but first and foremost, the need to move upon the physical interface and consequently within the virtual world. It is through the movement that non-trivial traversal enables the selection of some possibilities rather than others, and it is through physical and virtual movements that video game practices build their meaning. Each virtual experience sets up a system of specific movements going on to constitute form of gramma grammaticalization of movements and through them, their semantics. It's also possible 
for, for visual and kinetic syntaxes to work in a kind of dynamic opposition in order to build particular effects of meaning. For example, in Shadow of the Colossus, uh, published by Sony, um, these two syntaxes build a complex of modality through kinetic obligation. Players are required to do something they do not want to kill sacred beings called Colossi. This conflict between obligation imposed by the kinetic system and the beauty and sacredness of the victim contribute to create a dramatic and desperate effects of pathos. Second part of my talk uh, on immersion. Um, as far as the concept of immersion is concerned, there are many classification and description of it. In 1980, Marvin Minsky originally coined the term telepresence to describe the way a teleoperator moves a robot remotely using special gear. Through a system of feedback sensors, the operator has the experience of being present in the same remote location as the robot through a kind of effect of incorporation. More recently, a classification by Hermie and Myra distinguished three forms of immersion. Challenge based, that is based on the playful challenge and its mechanics, the so called flow. Secondly, the distinguished sensory immersion based on the audiovisual quality of the virtual world. And finally, imaginative immersion related to narrative immersion. Two criticisms can be made of these theorizations. The first one, the relationship between different immersion effects is not clear. Even while reading a novel, we can construct very articulate effects of immersion. We can feel emotion, we can feel strong empathy toward the character, even if we are not involved at the sensory level. Scientific reflection is mainly focused on the characteristic, characteristic that generate immersion as if it were the only effect sought by video game experience. And yet, the moments in which the player breaks this effect to activate tactics of interpretative distancing are equally important. If we consider virtual reality, uh, it increases the viewer's sense of immersion through the exclusion of the real world, which is eaten by the virtual element. And in, in my opinion, this immersive effect uh, is still related to movement, and more precisely to pragmatic movement realized by physical ends so as to manipulate virtual objects by means of virtual ends, but is mainly due to the partial remediation of perceptual movement. By moving one set, one changes the point of view of the virtual camera. Okay. Here's an example. Uh, Carne y Arena by Alejandro Gonzalo Sinarritu, a case already analyzed by Andrea Pinotti, which configures, for instance, an opposition between the spectator's immersion achieved through the virtual headset and the remediation of perceptual and pragmatic movements and the impossibility to, of carrying out meaningful action in the virtual env environment. In order to reproduce the feeling of Mexican migrants in the desert, Carney Arena sets up an experience of impotency. The spectator assumes the role of an anonymous and your character working in a date jostled by Hermot, Hermet policemen. I propose to reframe the reflection on immersion effects in terms of identity performance. The visual and kinetic syntaxes of virtual experiences prompt the viewer to combine his or her identity with that of virtual entities. On the one hand, the spectator identifies his or her action perform the interface with the movement realized within the virtual world, through a process of analogical transposition. On the other hand, there is the interpretive process by which to impersonate a virtual character different from oneself, as well as to inhabit in a precise way a virtual characterized world. Overall, the spectator accomplishes performances in which his or her identity is combined and stratified with that of other virtual identities. A process of imaginative mediation between kinetic identification and interpretative distance. Third part, I don't know how much time we have. You have uh, time. Uh, okay. You, you okay. have 50 minutes, 50 minutes at least. Okay. okay. 50. So, third part, <laughs> uh, it's, it's, um, it's uh, an analysis of, of a video game. 
which, uh, which allows us to articulate the relationship between visual and kinetic syntaxes. And the video game is uh, Zelda Breath of the Wild. In this video game, the two syntaxes are in fact closely interrelated with the visual interactive rendering of materials. As is well known, this is a video game released in 2017, acclaimed by critics and audiences alike for its playful innovation, and in particular for the physics and chemistry engine. The theme world is a fantasy world openly inspired by Studio Ghibli's production, and the plot is articulated according to a few obligatory junctures. If we sum on the two syntaxes we have just described, we can see that the traditional narrative that relies on film editing and visual syntax is quite, quite rarefied and not very present. In contrast, the kinetic syntax and construction of meaning that emerge directly from action in space is central. I can't go into detail uh, about the Greek variety of interaction, but I can show a short video. Does it have the um, oh, audio? No? Okay. Sorry, it is from a conference uh, in which um, the designer of, of the game explained uh, the, the interaction. So there is this interaction between different between different material and uh, an engine, a physical and uh, chemical engine. So, um, for instance, uh, one of the buttons on the, of the interface allows one to slash using the right arm of uh, Link, the, the avatar. This is precisely one of the movements imposed upon the player by, by the kinetic system. And yet, the effect resulting from this movement varies depending on which object is equipped and depending on its materiality. We wield as well the pressures applied uh, to the button will allow us to damage enemies, cut grass, cut ropes, and so on. However, a whole series of objects can be wielded. If instead of the sword we equip an axe, we can strike any tree, cut it down, and then use it as a bridge to cross streams, or we may continue eating it with the axe until it turns into a bundle of branches with which we could, for example, start a fight. Uh, if instead of the axe we wield a palm tree, the blows will not injure the enemies, but will produce an air blast capable of throwing them, them off to a distance and potentially over a, a cliff. Um, the result is a system of elemental interaction that gives great freedom to the player, prompting him or her to improvise ingenious thinking solutions to action that manipulate objects and materials. What I would like to do now uh, is not so much to analyze this interaction as to analyze the process of their selection uh, realized by uh, the designer working uh, in Nintendo. During the Game Developer Conference in 2017, the designer explained uh, the process behind the game's production, and in particular, this idea of uh, a multiplicative uh, gameplay. To expose the idea to the rest of the team and for working on the actual development of the three-dimensional version, the director asked the chief programmer to build a prototype using Stilites graphics that will show the variety of elemental and physical interaction. So the solution was as follows. The designers will take the graphics engine from the first episode of the saga, The Legend of Zelda, which was released in um, 1987, but implemented in a version that would allow for experimentation with materials. And I would like to show a short video about this prototype. So it's the graphic engine of the first episode, but um, with the physical 
engine of the last one, there are so, some comparison, comparison between the prototype and the final, uh, the final video game. Uh, what Nintendo designer seems to be doing, exploiting the morphology of the substance of materials, uh, what, exploiting what we know, what we commonly know about the interaction between substances and elements to build playful mechanisms. The prototype allowed us to enter into the process of sanitizing matter and substances and to identify some fundamental operations, which include the uh, a partial selection of objects, uh, material, and elements that are manipulable uh, within the game world. Uh, here, there are some of these elements, uh, water, fire, wood, metals, rock, electricity, and magnetism. Uh, this selection builds a finite set compared to the infinite complexity of the real world, of course. Uh, second operation, uh, an iconization on or better, an iconization of material qualities in their reaction. This is not aimed at an effect of extreme realism, but rather at a, at achieving a balance in the figurative density of object and material interaction in order to construct playful interaction. Um, to trivial example, uh, with a wooden tree in reality, we could do enormous things such as building statues, carving our name, building weapons, etc. In Zelda, we can burn it, cut it down, make wood from it, climb it, or push it on, uh, onto a stream of water with, where it will float. Uh, in other words, in accordance with the definition of hypo icon in Perse, while building design starting from the dynamic and immediate objects, some qualities are selected, and these qualities build a relationship of similarity. Third, um, a global civilization of material manipulation. In reality, to get wood from a tree or to burn it, we will need to work hard and long. In Zelda, two blows of the axe allow, allow us to cut it down. Or another example is, uh, is fire. Um, the propagation of fire is greatly diminished. diminished compared to how it behaves in reality. If we burn grass, the flames stop shortly afterwards. They do not spread as they would in real life. Uh, overly realistic fire will not be controllable and therefore not fun. So uh, I will insist on two, two crucial aspects of uh, the prototype uh, uh, and uh, of this uh, three operation in sanitizing materials. Uh, the first one is that uh, the elemental system is very simple at its basis uh, with only three physical and chemical laws for guiding all interaction. And second, uh, the concept of clever lies with which the programmers themselves describe the semiotic reproduction of materials and interaction. The word lies immediately bring us at the act of the problem. The system is not meant to build an effect of realism, nor it is meant to be purely playful. It is about lies that imbalance the recognition of material and their Abyssin transformation linked to common sense. In other words, the clever lies about the materials and the elements build a language or at least a semiotic system. Uh, which allows uh, matter to say something, not only with the visual language, but with transformative action. 
The morphology of matter becomes a playful uh, semiotic function that prompts experimentation, discovery, trial and error on the basis of a thin but strongly combinatorial system. So, uh, what then is this true dimensional prototype? First of all, it is, it is a design document allowing the designers and programmers of Nintendo to work uh, collectively. But it's also an interactive document, and more specifically, in semiotic terms, a complex creative diagram. Paraphrase first, the diagram is a semiotic object endowed with internal relations through which, by observing and manipulating its part, we can make discoveries about the relation concerning an object or a state of affairs, and in a sense, conceive, analyze, and explore it. The prototype of Zelda is a diagrammatic system that allows thinking about the interaction afforded by the world in a playful way, but its stylization allows creators to organize the design of situation to be included in the final product. For this reason, we will say that it is an elemental diagram used for creative purposes. The final product can also be described as a diagram. And yet, this system allows us to know, think, and experience the world in a semiotically oriented manner, in this case, in a playful manner. The elemental diagrams included in the final product are generators of play-like practice, was balanced between openness and closure, between imagination, interpretation, and action, is the experimental raison d'etre. So I will say, uh, if, yeah. I have <laughs> Uh, textually narrative semiotics is somewhat at a loss in the face of this openness because, because it is not relevant to analyze a semiotic action that has already been uh, realized. The diagrammatic aspect of experimentation with semiotic materials is simply lost. This final place. Uh, the, diagrammatic, the diagrammatic aspect of experimentation, uh, um, the playful diagram uh, can be defined as a generator of virtual narrative programs ready to be actualized and realized. The core meaning of this experience is exactly the ponderation among these virtual narrative programs, the prefiguration of possible act of man manipulation. In short, this case is a striking example of ergodic literature and processual meaning. In addition, not only does Zelda, as does any video game, require non-trivial physical effort to be traver traversed, but the immanent elemental system exponentially increases the range of possibilities that can, can be carried out. Um, there is an abundance of YouTube video from 2017 to the present day that features new and discovered interaction in, uh, in Zelda. For example, videos entitled The 10 Things You Still Didn't Know About the Zelda Breath of the Wild pro proliferate every week. And we'll also like to mention an article by researcher Michelle Westerlaken from Malmo University, who made a, mega, a vegan run of Zelda. She completed the game in accordance with, in accordance with her values as anti-species vegan. To me, this seems to be a perfect example, not only of the different styles adoptable by each player, thanks to the multiplicative gameplay at work in Zelda, but also of the identity performance enabled by video games in general, in a virtuous correlation between kinetic immersion and cognitive and realistic distancing. Thank you for your, for your attention.